Today we're going to talk about fake disease. We're living in the era of fake news after all, so it's only fitting. And I'm not talking about selfieitis or affluenza. I mean things like cancer. So what am I going on about? Well, this episode is about when cancer isn't cancer. Have you ever thought about getting one of those full body scans? You know the kind, a very emotive advert, perhaps on the train with a grieving wife and children. If only that dead fool had come in for our cancer screening service, he'd still be with his family today. They work on scaremongering and pretty much make it sound like it's almost your fault if you get some horrible disease because you simply weren't paying close enough attention to your health and that's why you should spend $9.99.99. Now I'm not going to tell you what to do with your money but I'm certainly not going to spend any of my own on a well-man checkup or full body scan and I'll try to explain why. The concepts in this video are some of the hardest to grasp in the whole of medicine so I'm not going to try and cover too much in this video and I'm I'm sure we can revisit things in future videos. Some of the things you'll hear will sound completely contradictory and counterintuitive. We'll start with Kevin Hart, who watches a news report about how many men his age are dropping down dead from heart disease. He sees a documentary about a CT scan that can detect early narrowing of the arteries before you have any symptoms. He pays handsomely for a cardiac CT scan which finds a 70% narrowing in a coronary artery which the reporting doctor calls a ticking time bomb. He undergoes the implantation of a stent, which is a procedure where we insert a tiny metal tube about the diameter of the spring inside your biro, but with much thinner metal. Unfortunately, he suffers quite extensive bleeding in his right arm, which gets very swollen and he has to stay in hospital for a couple of days and can't drive for a month. But after all that, he's okay. Next up, we've got Mary Mellon a 45-year-old woman who hears that breast screening saves lives. She attends for mammography, a government-run program, so paid for by taxes. It's a very uncomfortable test, but she soldiers through because she feels it's important and is shocked to hear an abnormality was found. She has a biopsy which shows ductal carcinoma in situ, a type of cancer. She's got two young children, she's terrified and opts to have a complete mastectomy along with an unpleasant course of chemotherapy. She develops an infection of the surgical area, it takes a while to heal and she's left with permanent swelling of her left arm. But after all that, she's okay. So how do you think Kevin and Mary feel? All right, they're Operations had some complications, but at the end of the day, they're alive. They feel like their lives have been saved. Their families are overjoyed. Their diseases were caught early. They probably feel tremendous gratitude and are likely to recommend the test to all their friends and family. And who can blame them, especially when the doctors themselves often reinforce this belief. But is what they believe actually true? In both cases, we know that, in fact, the likely outcome of them undergoing those initial tests is that they've been harmed more than they've benefited. We know that for stable, asymptomatic patients like Kevin, stents do not prolong life nor reduce the likelihood of having a heart attack. And in fact, I don't think anybody would put a stent in Kevin today, but this scenario would have been very common a few years ago. Don't get me wrong, for unstable patients, people having chest pain, people having heart attacks, stents are life-saving and one of the best therapies we have in medicine, in fact, but not for patients like Kevin. For Mary, the biopsy did show cancer, but it's a cancer that might never have caused her any symptoms whatsoever. And potentially, she had a breast removed and developed this long-term arm swelling for no net gain. If both of those last two paragraphs sound confusing, don't worry, just stay with me. If you have a pain and come to see me as your doctor and I send off a test, that's called investigation. That's me trying to find a cause for your symptoms. But if you don't have any symptoms, you feel completely fine like Kevin and Mary did, and then I send off a test, that's called screening. Screening is where we try to look for the signs of a problem before a patient has any symptoms. However, Unfortunately, screening is a very complicated topic and often one that's quite emotive as well and therefore difficult to discuss. So today we're just going to talk, talk about two concepts, lead time bias and overdiagnosis. Let's start with how we talk about disease prognosis. You've all seen that cliched conversation in movies where the protagonist says, Doc, be honest with me, how long do I have? And the doctor solemnly replies, you have only six months to live. 
yes, you probably don't watch as much Nigerian cinema as I do, but you get the idea. In reality, it doesn't work like that, because everybody's different. In fact, surveys of palliative care doctors who deal with death more than anybody else show that even they are spectacularly bad at predicting when a person with a, an illness will die. Instead, we talk about populations. So we say, if you take 100 people with this particular cancer, then in five years' time, 80 of them, on average, will be alive. Now, this is a statistic called five-year survival, which is used very commonly, but it's misleading. Rudy Giuliani, some years ago, was trying to explain why he felt American privatised healthcare was superior to the British National Health Service, which is free at the point of access. And he said, I had prostate cancer five, six years ago, my chance of surviving prostate cancer, and thank God I was cured of it in the United States, 82%. My chance of surviving prostate cancer in England, only 44% under socialised medicine. Now that sounds like a pretty clear demonstration that the aggressive screening programme for prostate cancer in America has saved many, many lives. But the death rate from prostate cancer in the UK and the US was pretty much identical. So how can both statements be true? Let's say that this is the point at which prostate cancer causes symptoms and is diagnosed. And here is when the average man dies. When we hear five-year survival rates have improved due to screening, we assume it's because people are dying later. But actually, it's because we're diagnosing them earlier. If you diagnose someone here, even though they're dying at the exact same time, you've not helped them in any way, their survival time from diagnosis is better, simply because you've diagnosed them earlier. This is lead time bias, and it's frequently misused to show that screening works. In fact, the correlation coefficient between five-year survival and death for the most common cancers was looked at, and it was zero. And that's really saying something. There's no link between five-year survival and how many people are dying from a disease, which is, of course, the thing that any sufferer cares about. So we should just stop using five-year survival and focus on mortality. It seems like common sense to think that earlier diagnosis equals earlier effective treatment. And of course, sometimes that is true. But the big problem is, is that our treatments are far from perfect. And in fact, a lot of them are harmful in themselves, or the tests that we do after that initial test might be as well. And another huge challenge is you're going to end up treating a lot of fake disease. And by that I mean an abnormality that's been detected on a test that is not causing and would not cause that patient any problems whatsoever. This is overdiagnosis, and it's becoming more and more common as our tests are becoming more sensitive, and we're able to pick up abnormalities that we would have never previously been able to detect. Here are five of the most common cancers in the US, all of which are routinely screened for or being picked up as incidental findings in body scans. You'll see that over the last 40 years, the number of cancers being diagnosed has gone up across the board, but the lower lines, deaths from those cancers, have remained remarkably stable. So either our treatments are getting better at exactly the same rate as the increase in cases, or we're diagnosing things that aren't causing any harm, aka fake disease. In fact, just last month, a large and important trial was published looking at lung cancer screening. Now, lung cancer is one of the most deadly diseases, killing millions of people around the world. And it's the kind of thing you really hope a screening program would work for. But in response to the question, does lung cancer screening save lives, the answer was a clear no. The patients who were screened and had their lung cancer diagnosed earlier had more scans, more invasive tests, and more treatment like chemo and radiotherapy, but no difference in death rate. On that point, I want to briefly mention the Apple Watch, because I've made a couple of videos about it, and make a little comparison here. So in this trial, patients at high-risk smokers were screened for a deadly disease, lung cancer, and no benefit was found. The Apple Watch looks for atrial fibrillation, which is a much less deadly disease than lung cancer, and the people wearing the Apple Watch, on the whole, are at a very low risk of atrial fibrillation. So while I've made it clear that I think the potential for what we can do with the Apple Watch is very exciting, and it's a fantastic technology, when I say that it's unlikely to save lives, I'm normally met with complete incredulity. 
Okay, here's another way to look at it. This is adapted from H. Gilbert Welsh's Teaching on Screening. Please do check the references below as I put some extra reading there, especially that of H. Gilbert Welsh and Margaret McCartney, two fantastic writers and two heroes of mine in this field, uh, which I really recommend. Let's say a cancerous process starts here. Some nasty genetic mutation or fault of cell division. Along the y-axis we have size of the cancer. At a given size, the cancer will cause symptoms to the patient. And then, at another size, it will cause death. The x-axis is time. And over on the right is where the patient dies of a non-cancer cause. So, the time they would die if they never got cancer. This is a fast-growing cancer which causes death not long after it's first noticed by the patient. These are not picked up with screening normally as there's not much chance to catch them. And as you might imagine, they have a poor prognosis. Here we see a cancer growing at a medium rate. It eventually will cause death earlier than the patient would have otherwise lived, so this is the type of cancer you want to pick up with screening. But there's another kind of cancer. This is a very slow-growing cancer, which the patient dies with, but not from. And this is an important phrase in medicine. If you look down a microscope, the cells have all the hallmarks of cancer, but it's not cancer in the way that you or I or society understands it. This is cancer that isn't cancer, at least not with a big C. The classic example of this is prostate cancer, which about half of older men have when they die of another cause, and it's only detected on post-mortem. Thyroid cancer rates in people who die of other causes is similar. And yet more types of cancer do this. They just sit there. Mary's ductal carcinoma in situ might go in this group. And some even regress. In fact, some people don't even call what Mary had a cancer, even though on a cellular level it definitely is. If your screening test identifies any of these, that's overdiagnosis. Disease, from the Latin literally meaning without ease, is not present if the pathology is not causing any symptoms nor adversely affecting the person's life. So this is what I mean by fake disease. Treating these will not only not help the patient, but may even harm them, which is the one thing that doctors are definitely not supposed to do. But of course, when you're over on the left side of the graph, it's impossible to predict the trajectory of which of those lines the cancer in question will follow, so of course you end up treating all of them. And patients with fake disease confuse the statistics like this. If you have 100 patients with a particular cancer, in five years' time, 50% of them are alive. That's a survival rate of 50%. But with screening, you may pick up another 100 who have fake disease. And now you've got 200 patients to start with. In five years' time, 50 are still dead. You haven't prevented a single death. But you can immediately claim that survival rate is now 75% because 150 patients are still alive at five years. Great success! In these Ducks Like a Quack videos, I often talk about the power of anecdote, normally as a problematic thing. For example, if I show you a meta-analysis of coagulated casein genuflexion and its effect on self-reported tibiofemoral intraarticular pain, you'll probably glaze over. But if I slap some America's Got Talent sob story music on in the background and tell you about my crippling knee pain that was ignored for years by the uncaring, heartless medical profession until I built a church made of cheese and knelt at its cheddar altar every night until my knee pain was miraculously cured. Now you're interested. Oh God of cheese, hear my prayer! So I thought I'd join in with an anecdote of my own, particularly because I'm aware that my attitude is completely opposite to celebrities you'll see on TV acting as patrons for various charities, saying that their disease or cancer was caught just in the nick of time, so make sure you get screened. And by the way, I'm not attacking those celebrities at all. Kudos to them for, for doing a good thing. If screening is misunderstood by many in the medical profession, then it's unfair to expect anything different from non-medics. Incidentaloma is the name given to an unexpected finding on a scan in a tissue or an organ that was normally not the intended target of the test. As the number of uh, radiology tests we're requesting is increasing, as the scans themselves are getting more and more sensitive, the rate of incidentalomas is soaring. The most commonly requested tests, things like CT scans of the chest and abdomen, or something that I report, a cardiac MRI scan, uh, account for loads of these incidentalomas. Cardiac MRI is now the number two source of incidentalomas in the US. 
A cardiac MRI is where we use an MRI machine to scan the heart, but because the heart is in the middle of the chest, you get all the surrounding structures, so top of the kidneys, liver, lungs, and the thyroid, which is just here in the neck. I was reporting the scan of a 42-year-old woman who I'll call Sophie, who initially presented with a very non-worrying, innocent-sounding history of palpitation, fluttering heart. And her heart was completely normal on the scan, but I spotted something in her thyroid uh, gland, which, as I'm not a specialist, I referred on. And this led to what's called a cascade of care. She had blood tests, she had further scans, she had a biopsy of the thyroid gland, which is where we stick a needle into the neck. And that was inconclusive, so she had to have the test repeated. It showed some concerning changes for cancer. So now she's got this scary label of thyroid cancer when she only went in to see her GP in the first place for some uh, fluttering heartbeats which have now completely resolved. She's told she needs an operation, which she undergoes. She has part of her thyroid gland removed, but unfortunately her recurrent laryngeal nerve, which supplies the voice box, is damaged. Sophie uh, then has radioactive iodine treatment as part of the ongoing therapy of her thyroid cancer, which is generally quite safe, but has one major side effect. Now, Sophie is a singer. She'd had a pretty exciting life touring the world as a backup singer for various groups and had never planned. I love trying to find my contact lenses without my contact lenses. Therapy of her thyroid cancer, which is generally quite safe, but has one major side effect. Now, Sophie is a singer. She'd had a pretty exciting life touring the world as a backup singer for various groups and had never planned on settling down. But recently she met a guy and they had settled down and then decided to have kids. And she knew full well that at the age of 42, it was pretty late. But for the last year, uh, her fiance and her had been trying. But then when this came along, the thing with radioactive iodine is that you mustn't get pregnant. Add to that, her voice never recovered from the operation, which obviously as a singer was devastating. Her thyroid became underactive, so she has to take replacement medications and she'll be on those for life. With all this going on, not only the radioactive iodine, but the whole stress of the situation, she lost a year and she feels that that was her last chance to, to try to get pregnant. I could have picked a very black and white story where an incidental OMA was picked up that was definitely not harmful and the patient underwent a litany of tests and horrendous complications. And believe me, every uh, medic knows a story like that, but I chose this one because it's actually had an impact on me. I don't know if the thyroid cancer would have killed Sophie. Perhaps it would. Perhaps it was for the best that she went through all of that in spite of the complications. I'll never have the answer to whether that thyroid cancer should have come out or not, and neither will Sophie. And that uncertainty, unfortunately, is central to everything we do in medicine. Our tests are not perfect. They produce false positives. But even when the results are genuine, it's not always entirely clear what we do with that information. I can only apologize to you as the public that you get such conflicting messages about things like screening. And as I said at the beginning of this video, I am not suggesting to anybody watching not to have a screening test. But hopefully now you can make a more informed decision. I'm on my way to work. Uh, back to the grind after a few magical days in the company of some of the best educational YouTubers out there. Imbibe.